Mr. President, on behalf of the Ethiopian delegation and myself, I wish to extend my heartfelt congratulations to you, Ms. Sir, on your election as President of the 47th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. My delegation is confident that under your wise guidance, the current session of the General Assembly will achieve outstanding successes. In this connection, I wish to assure Your Excellency of my delegation's full cooperation in the discharge of your responsibilities. I also wish to express my delegation's sincere appreciation to your predecessor, Mr. Samir Shehabi of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for his able stewardship of the 46th session of the General Assembly. Likewise, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to Dr. Boutros Boutros Kali, the Secretary General of the United Nations, for his vigorous efforts to fulfill the mandate bestowed upon him by the world community. We are confident that under his able leadership, the stature of and credibility of the United Nations would be further enhanced. We wish him very success, every success in his endeavors. My delegation is also pleased to extend cordial welcome to all the new members of the United Nations who had joined our family during the last 12 months. Mr. President, the end of the Cold War, which has been a great turning point in history, has been followed by further positive changes in the international political climate. However, it is a matter of concern to us that there are still conflicts raging in many parts of the world. The Tau in relations between East and West did not necessarily lead to total peace, devoid of human suffering and hardships. In this regard, I would like to draw the attention of the Assembly to the unfolding tragedy in Somalia, which defies imagination and affronts our senses and sensibilities. Over the past two years, the situation in the country has deteriorated so much that the state has ceased to exist. Law and order, peace and stability, and the basic infrastructure necessary for the life of a functioning society are virtually non-existent. These have all been destroyed by acts of intensive warfare, the extent of whose damage and the consequent human suffering combine to make Somalia one of the worst humanitarian crises in living memory. It is lamentable that Somalia is bleeding to death by the actions of her own sons. Nearly half the total population of the country has been dislocated by war and famine. Scores of children and old people are dying every day while thousands have perished. The Somali people have left their homes and fled to neighboring and other countries. Looking at the situation in Somalia today, it is pertinent to ask why the various factions are doing all this to their own country and people. Why is this wanton destruction for the sake of political power over a disintegrating country? How can one explain what is being done to the people of Somalia, which goes beyond any conceivable political cause or justification when we, we see children, women and the elderly being killed indiscriminately merely because they belong to this clan or that subclan. Mr. President, this nightmare has to come to an immediate end. 
the Ethiopian people can speak from their own history of 30 years of conflict, that war and the application of brute force and senseless destruction cannot by any means provide the solution to a country's political problems. We believe that the bloodletting in Somalia during the past two years should serve as a sufficient lesson to the various factions that the path of conflict could not lead to more, could only lead to more catastrophe. Historical knowledge confirms beyond reasonable doubt that the use of force or war had never achieved durable results in the conduct of human affairs. It is our firm conviction that the protagonists in the current crisis in Somalia should make the welfare and interests of the country and people they claim to represent uppermost in their minds. It must be stated, Mr. President, that Somalia's neighbors, the countries of the Horn of Africa, did not spare the slightest effort to bring about a peaceful solution of the tragic conflict. It will be recalled that the Horn of Africa Summit on Humanitarian Issues was convened in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in April 1992. The main objective of the summit was to explain, to examine the serious humanitarian crisis in the sub-region and work with regional organizations and the United Nations in order to save lives and ultimately bring the warring factions together with the view to seek solution to the, to the fratricidal conflict. At the end of the summit, a declaration, framework of cooperation, and action program was issued. This was followed by the Horn of Africa Conference on Humanitarian Issues held to formulate modalities for the effective implementation of the summit declaration. A resolution on the situation in Somalia was subsequently adopted, which inter alia provided for the ceasefire among the warring factions, the holding of immediate peace talks leading to national reconciliation and lasting political settlement in the country, and unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance to the people in need. Most significantly, the summit decided to establish a high-level standing committee of the Horn of Africa on Somalia to coordinate ongoing efforts to bring about peaceful resolution of the conflict. In fulfillment of its mandate, the committee convened an all-party meeting on Somalia in Bahardar, Ethiopia, in May 1992. At the meeting, agreement was reached on the effective distribution of humanitarian assistance and on convening a national reconciliation conference. To follow up the implementation of these two agreements, the chairman and members of the committee visited Somalia twice in May and August 1992 and held talks with leaders of various political organizations. The result of the mission has been generally satisfactory under the circumstance. The committee is still actively seized with the crisis in Somalia in all its aspects. The effort by the countries of the Horn of Africa is a practical manifestation of the principle that regional conflicts should as far as possible be resolved by the countries of the area concerned. Although the situation in Somalia has for some time been ignored and left to the sidelines, it is encouraging to note that the United Nations and other donor governments are giving it the necessary attention it so rightly deserves. The international effort to distribute humanitarian assistance to those in need should be further intensified as a matter of top priority. The efforts underway by the Horn of African governments, the United Nations, 
the Organization of African Unity, and others to bring about lasting peace in Somalia should henceforth be pursued in a coordinated manner. We should all speak with one voice to the parties in the conflict. The message they should get should be one and only one that they cannot continue with their callous disregard for the interests and welfare of the people of Somalia, that the existence of Somalia as a nation should first and foremost be a paramount importance, that there is no way they can achieve their aims through war, and they should be prepared to resolve their differences through peaceful means. In this connection, it is sad to note that there are quarters who are undermining the peaceful resolution of this crisis by supplying weapons to the warring factions instead of relief assistance to the suffering people of Somalia, or dump industrial toxic waste on Somali territory instead of providing medicine to take care of the sick and wounded, and plunder the livestock and marine resources of Somalia instead of providing critically needed humanitarian assistance. We call on these quarters to desist from attempts to polarize the region of the Horn and instead work with us in partnership in our efforts to restore durable peace and stability in Somalia. Mr. President, turning to another issue of concern to us, we have been following closely the positive developments in South Africa. However, we still have serious misgivings about the prospect for the peaceful transformation of South Africa as the system of apartheid still remains in place. We are deeply committed to the decisions and positions of the Organization of African Unity and those of the United Nations emphasized repeatedly over the years, as well as the principled stand of the democratic forces in South Africa to end the apartheid system once and for all, and set in motion the irreversible process of change towards a multiracial and democratic political order in the country. The current efforts to create the conditions necessary for the success of peaceful negotiations should be encouraged. In this connection, the recent agreement between the ANC and the government to resume negotiations and the release of political prisoners are positive developments. We look forward to the initiation of future talks between all the democratic forces in South Africa and the government with a view to establishing an interim government to supervise the process of preparation towards a future constitutional order for a multiracial and democratic South Africa. Likewise, we are gravely concerned about the tragic situation in the former Yugoslavia, particularly in Bosnia-Herzegovina. This crisis, which is fast getting out of control, is a serious threat to international peace and security. The continuing bloodshed should be brought to an end and a political solution acceptable to all parties should be found as soon as possible. In this respect, we are hopeful that the conference currently underway in Geneva under the auspices of the United Nations and the European community would achieve concrete results. We are also following the current peace process in the Middle East. Despite repeated efforts by the international community to broker peace, the situation in the Middle East still hangs in the balance. Nevertheless, the prospects for peace in the area are better today than they have been for a long time. We are therefore hopeful that the Palestinian question, which is at the core of the Middle East problem, would eventually be resolved in accordance with the relevant UN resolutions with a view to achieving a just and durable 
global settlement for the region as a whole. Mr. President, we are gratified at the outcome of the efforts of the Conference on Disarmament with regard to chemical weapons. The draft treaty prohibiting the production, use, transfer, and stockpiling of chemical weapons signifies an important step in the global effort to eliminate weapons of mass destruction. We draw special satisfaction from the success of this nearly 25 years of effort in the disarmament process and Ethiopia's contribution as a member of the Conference on Disarmament. In view of current trend towards democracy and respect for human rights, there is a need for the disarmament negotiations to include conventional weapons. It should be underscored here that the peace dividend from disarmament efforts should be channeled to fight the problems of poverty, disease, and backwardness in developing countries. Mr. President, it goes without saying that the opportunities created in the past few years to secure a more just and stable international order cannot be fruit if a parallel effort is not exerted with increased vigor to bring about positive change in international economic relations. In this regard, much more is expected from the United Nations. The United Nations Conference on Environment and Development held in Rio, Brazil, in the middle of this year, has demonstrated the great importance the international community attaches to the pressing issues of environment and development. Environmental protection and economic development bear on the future of mankind and affect each country. Therefore, our collective and individual strategic planning activities should aim at solving these two global problems which call for effective international cooperation and mutual consultation. The Rio Declaration and Agenda 21, as well as the two conventions, the Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity, lay a good foundation for enhanced international cooperation in this area. Moreover, sufficient focus is yet to be given to address the problems of environmental pollution and ecological degradation and desertification. Mr. President, there are certain fundamental thoughts we would like to share with regard to the promotion and strengthening of democracy and democratic institutions in the context of the present international relations. Although democracy may have certain universal features, it is equally true that it also has unique characteristics peculiar to a particular country's socio-political situation. In effect, there cannot be a standard prescription for building democracy applicable to all societies and situations. Realization of this fact should retain, restrain any attempt to prescribe uniform modalities and processes for the establishment of democracy and democratic institutions in different countries. It is incumbent upon those who claim to stand for democracy to help newly democratizing peoples in their effort to consolidate their democratic process rather than confining themselves to leveling criticisms from the sidelines. If in our answer, unrelenting struggle to democratize our country, those forces advocating the strengthening of democracy fail to extend a helping hand and simply watch from a distance any weakening 
or failure of the process of democratization would at least in part be attributed to their lack of cooperation. It goes without saying that democracy is unthinkable without peace and stability, both internal and interstate. Thus, if the force of democracy support internal democratization process, this would mean a significant step forward in the resolution of internal conflicts. Interstate conflicts can be settled by democratizing interstate relations and by scrupulous observation of norms of international law on interstate relations. Although the parties to an interstate dispute are primarily responsible for the peaceful resolution of their problems, the United Nations and the international community can and should, place, should play a significant role in encouraging peaceful settlement of disputes, in the course of which sanctions would be applied as the last resort against a recalcitrant party violating basic norms of interstate relations once all other attempts to resolve disputes have been fully exhausted. It is evident that democracy cannot be nurtured and sustained to grow into a robust institution in countries characterized by economic deprivation and destitution. It is therefore imperative to democratize the internal, international economic order with the same vigor we deploy to democratize the international political order if we are to strengthen democracy and democratic institutions. To this end, developing countries as a whole should be given assistance to extricate themselves from the quagmire of poverty and underdevelopment. Failure to do so on the part of developed countries would mean aggravation of international tension and conflict in a different form, thereby adversely affecting all our efforts towards lasting peace and socio-economic development. In order to forestall such an eventuality, the United Nations and the international community should go beyond paying lip service to democracy and development and provide meaningful economic assistance to developing countries. Only then can we say the international peace and development are guaranteed. Mr. President, at this juncture, allow me to say a few words on developments in Ethiopia since the establishment of the transitional government just over a year ago. The demise of the repressive military regime in May 1991 and the assumption of, of power by democratic forces and the endorsement of transitional charter have heralded a new chapter in the history of our country in which freedom, equal rights, and self-determination of all peoples are the guiding principles of political, economic, and social life. During this short period, while striving to ensure durable peace and stability, after 30 years of bloody civil war, we have been able to lay the groundwork for the creation of a new political order in a country where very little has been known about democratic, political, and institutional mechanisms. The Transitional Charter laid the basis for the establishment of a broad-based administration accommodating a wide spectrum of political views, regional interests, and national aspirations. The Council of Representatives, which is the highest legislative authority, consists of dozens of political and social organizations. Moreover, with a view to paving the way for the implementation of the right to self-determination of all peoples in Ethiopia, as enshrined in our transitional charter, we have taken the first significant step by successfully holding 
the first democratic local and regional elections in the country's history in the presence of international observers. The administration is now firmly in place, leading towards the consolidation of peace, stability, democracy, reconstruction, and development in the country. The protection of human rights is at the top of the agenda of the transitional government. Internationally recognized human rights and fundamental freedoms are fully guaranteed in Ethiopia for the first time. The transitional government is fully committed to uphold and protect the rights of individuals and peoples based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. To this effect, we have initiated a process by which Ethiopia is to accede to the various international covenants on human rights. The transitional government of Ethiopia was established under circumstances left by the proceeding absolute dictatorship in the country. It was a situation where government accountability and responsibility were unknown. Democratic culture and institutions were non-existent and where the country's infrastructure was devastated by a long drawn out war and recurrent drought and famine. Although the absence of pluralist political culture and institutional mechanisms, as well as the fact that our country has just come out of an extended period of intense civil war, have a significant impact upon the process of democratization in Ethiopia in general, the process of democratization, decentralization, and devolution of power is right on track in Ethiopia. This does not, however, mean that the transition from war to peace and from dictatorship to democracy is a smooth process. That is why we chose to go through a transition process with a view to making it possible for us to lay down the necessary preconditions towards a full-fledged democratic order. We have made significant progress in all these areas during the past year of the transition period. As part of the continuing process of democratization in our country, the Council of Representatives has issued a proclamation on the setting up of a constitution drafting commission which is about to embark upon its important task as soon as organizational matters are finalized. The lesson we have drawn from the first year of transition period is the establishment of democracy, dependable democratic institutions and democratic culture in a least developed country like Ethiopia with an economy devastated by war and natural calamities is an extremely arduous undertaking. However, committed one may be, or however strenuously one may strive to achieve this goal, the process is bound to be very slow and full of difficulties and complications. This is not a sign of despair, but an acknowledgement of a concrete reality, which is a necessary first step to success in any undertaking. Undaunted by the adverse internal situation at the outset, the transitional government took and is taking bold and decisive steps to lay the groundwork for the socio-economic transformation and democratization of the country. Thus, building of democratic institutions carrying out major economic reforms, in instituting human rights and fundamental freedoms previously unknown in Ethiopia, such as freedom of assembly and association, freedom of expression without any censorship, encouraging this, the formation of numerous political organizations which are now exercising democratic rights without any hindrance are only the most salient achievements of the transitional government in the brief period of one year. As a result, we can, with full confidence,
confidence assert that a new democratic culture and institution are taking shape in our country today. The unity of Ethiopia is being guaranteed on the basis of the unswerving recognition and accommodation of diversity. Again, bold and in many ways unique steps are being taken to resolve the country's internal problems. Although problems may persist, our internal experiment at their resolution is already paying dividends. The Eritrean question has also been resolved by the recognition of the right to self-determination of the Eritrean people. A referendum will be held early next year in the presence of international observers, including the United Nations, to determine definitively the future status of Eritrea. The decision to resolve the Eritrean question through a referendum is one which both in the, the transitional government of Ethiopia and the provisional government of Eritrea have subscribed to fully without any reservation. They have also declared in no uncertain terms that they will accept the results of the referendum. In effect, the decision is ours and ours alone and belongs in no way to any external force. We are confident that once the people of Eritrea have freely decided their own future, no matter what the outcome of the referendum, the existing and fast developing economic, trade, and social relations between the two peoples based on mutual trust and benefit will be a trial blazer for an economic and social integration in the Horn of Africa subregion which we hope to see materialized in the not too distant future. Mr. President, turning to our economic situation, it has been repeatedly stated that Ethiopia's economic potentials sharply contrast with its socioeconomic underdevelopment. In addition to drought, war, and famine, mismanagement of the national economy over the years by the former regime have militated against a steady growth of the national economy. Under these rather difficult circumstances, the transitional government of Ethiopia has embarked upon a comprehensive program of new economic policy measures and institutional reform aimed at increasing the role of the private sector in the national economy rationalizing the public enterprises, improving their management, and generally allowing the promotion of market economy principles and mechanisms. It is imperative that we should exert maximum effort to overcome the multifaceted problems facing the country today and revitalize our national economy. However, it is evident that such an undertaking calls for the availability of vast resources which cannot be mobilized at the national level alone. We therefore call on the international community to extend humanitarian as well as development assistance to supplement our domestic efforts to cope with the emergency situation. The positive response and goodwill demonstrated by various donor countries and international organizations in the past one year is in support of the our economic recovery and reconstruction program is encouraging. We are hopeful that such support will continue. Mr. President, the changes underway in Ethiopia are having an impact on the country's external relations. Thus, for the first time in several decades, our relations with all our neighbors in the Horn of Africa are being strengthened on a qualitatively new level. Harmonious cooperation in all fields is fast developing in our sub-region. Our relations with other countries are also developing on the same basis and are showing encouraging results. 
In this new experiment of nation building, Ethiopia has from the outset enjoyed the goodwill of many countries. Some have also extended material assistance. We wish to express our deep gratitude to all who have helped us in one way or another. Nevertheless, we have to admit regrettably the fact that the assistance we have so far received, in particular material assistance, falls short of what is needed to make our ex effort at socioeconomic development a success. We therefore call upon again all our friends to provide us with meaningful assistance at this crucial phase of our history. Mr. President, in conclusion, I would also like to reiterate Ethiopia's readiness to participate in all endeavors aimed at enhancing the role of our organization in the maintenance of international peace and security and in assisting the developing countries in their efforts to achieve a greater degree of economic development and self-reliance. I'm hopeful that the present session would review and assess the world situation with a new perspective and a bold approach in order to meet the imperative of the time. We must encourage and promote the positive trends already evident in international relations and at the same time guard against certain tendencies which carry patent seed of new crisis. I thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Transnational Government of Ethiopia. <clears throat> I now call on the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Uzbekistan, His Excellency Mr. Ubaidullah Abdul Razakouf. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me most cordially join in congratulating Your Excellency, the President of the 47th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. The delegation of the Republic of Uzbekistan for the first time is taking part as an independent state in the work of the United Nations General Assembly. It is an honor for us to express our sincere gratitude to all UN member states for their support and cooperation rendered to the young and independent Republic of Uzbekistan. We are most grateful to the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Boutros Boutros Ghali, for the special attention he continues to give our region. The decision to open the United Nations Permanent Mission and a number of its specialized organizations in Tashkent is a clear manifestation of this attention. Such an approach comes from the fundamental United Nations activities at the present time, which were formulated by the Secretary General in his report, Agenda for Peace. The people of Uzbekistan has just solemnly marked the first anniversary of their Independence Day. The fact that now we have begun building an independent state is the logical result of the constant century-long struggle of our people a selfless struggle waged by its best sons for independence. Achieving independence has never been easy anywhere in the world. That is why our year of independence is only the beginning of a long process. We are laying the basis now of an independent Uzbek state. We have preserved our language, religion, traditions, customs, and moral principles from the danger of total loss. 
we have fully restored our national values. Our natural resources, economic, scientific, technical, and moral potential, this potential which was established through the work of previous generations can serve as a foundation for the social and economic progress of an independent Uzbekistan. And to make this potential a real force, our republic under the leadership of President Islam Karimov has worked out the appropriate system and is looking for the best governmental structure and management structure, ways to develop the economy and to build a sound domestic and foreign policy. We are taking social security measures to protect the population from the inevitable suffering which occurs in the process of moving toward a market economy new to Uzbekistan. In the process of building a new independent state, we shall utilize the positive experience of other developed nations based on openness and market relations. Of course, in so doing, we take into consideration, first and foremost, the specifics of our country, its concrete national and cultural traditions, and of the people who live in it. We aspire to create a social and political system such that it will unswervingly comply with the principles of human rights and freedom. Our state policy is aimed at protecting the interests and rights of all peoples, irrespective of their nationality, religion, and convictions, and the preservation and development of their cultures, languages, national traditions and customs with their active involvement in state and public life. We have unequivocally rejected the domination of any one ideology or philosophy, any one world view. We, in fact, have established a multi-party system and reaffirm it as an essential and natural element of genuine democracy. At the same time, we have banned those forces and movements which are attempting through blackmail threats and violence to change the state system and who threaten territorial integrity and the security of our republic, who try to create ethnic and religious hostility and who encroach on the constitutional system and moral basis of the people's life. We demand that the activity of all forces and movements be carried out within the framework of the rule of law in our economic policy we have eliminated and rejected a system based on the command system, a highly centralized distribution system, and we fully exclude such ideology. All types of property now are given equal rights. Of course, our political and economic programs are being carried out with difficulties, and all of us admit this. Now our people is going through a difficult transformation period, the transition period. This is all a consequence of the fact that for many years a policy was conducted towards our, our republic, which was one of dictatorship. As a result of that policy, our economy was dependent and our region became an appendage for raw materials. It is not easy for our people to rid themselves of the consequences of the totalitarian hegemony of the communist ideas, of course. The creation of a new and just society is not work for one day or even one year. We all are clearly aware of that. The most important thing is that on the basis of inter-ethnic agreement and the unity of citizens, we establish in our country a stable social and political situation. The people of our region which is called Central Asia, or the Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Tajiks, Turkmen, Kyrgyz. We are all children of the same forefathers. We have one land and water, one religion, history, fate, the same cares, joys, and troubles. Historically, we have always been naturally connected and interdependent. We created our common history through cooperation. Many of our internal problems are now in the process of development, but they could easily become inter-ethnic or international and affect the interests of the peoples who populate our regions. 
this is a specific characteristic of our general situation and the international position of Uzbekistan and Central Asia as a whole. At the present time, the government and people of Uzbekistan are deeply concerned with the development of the events within Tajikistan, which is on the brink of civil war. The serious international danger here is that armed clashes between the fighting forces claim thousands of victims among civilians could easily spread to the neighboring Central Asian states. In the region of Central Asia, with a dense population of more than 50 million people, such armed conflicts could have unpredictable consequences. In the case of the spread of conflict, the peoples of Central Asia could be involved in an endless fratricidal war, which ultimately would bring nothing to their recently obtained freedom and independence. This is the main threat in the current situation for us. We have good reasons for concern. In fact, the border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan remains open there are hundreds of thousands of armed men. The actions of extremists and fanatics from armed groups who are instigated by those playing on national and religious feelings of the people could have unpredictable consequences. Uzbekistan is strongly opposed to interference in the internal affairs of independent Tajikistan and is against kindling the flames of war. Uzbekistan advocates averting armed conflict and finding an urgent solution through peaceful and civilized means. Uzbekistan supports the appeal of the government of Tajikistan to the United Nations to render assistance in finding a solution to the serious crisis which could become international in nature. Uzbekistan believes that in this situation a decisive play can be played by the United Nations and the CSCE in being fully aware of the danger of the situation and adhering to a feeling of humanity, and also by demonstrating responsibility for the fates of our people, Uzbekistan has requested the United Nations Secretary General, His Excellency Butros Butros Ghali, to examine the existing situation and inform the United Nations Security Council, the UN committees and commissions of our concerns. The President of the Republic of Uzbekistan, Islam Karimov, in his message to the United Nations Secretary General, emphasized that only timely and effective assistance rendered by the international community can be the decisive factor in support of the democratization process and of the political and economic reforms which have begun in the new young independent states of the region. In putting forward such an initiative, Uzbekistan is proceeding from the concept that the main dominant idea of the new international order should be based on the prevention of aggression and conflicts and on the democratic machinery for its realization. That concept was compellingly put forward as preventive diplomacy by the UN Secretary General, His Excellency Butus Butus Kali. We see the guarantee of such prevention in cooperation in the broad meaning of this word. I believe that the above mentioned is sufficient to understand the need for creating in the region a United Nations Eastern Oriental Center with the aim of spreading the principles of international community and international norms in the central part of the Euro-Asian continent. I believe that Tashkent, as a historical center of this region, with its great history and modern experience in peacemaking activities, is fully worthy of this honor. This will provide the international community with reliable information concerning the processes of social development in the region and will expedite solutions to its problems and make it a zone free from any conflicts. And as we see it, this is in fact the main aim of the United Nations and the new international order. I thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Uzbekistan. We have heard the last speaker in the general debate for this meeting. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>